it is am it amazes me that you could all be thinking uh, how kind of Jonathan Berger to present me with these two videos with which to start my talk uh, with the same piece of music played in two different spaces. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands or anything, but just think to yourself, which performance of Jerusalem did you find more inspiring, the one in the secular space of the Albert Hall, the first one, or the one in the sacred space of Westminster Abbey, the second one? First one. The first one, so the secular space was more sacred to you. Okay, so this is just because I, I want I, I chose those just because I wanted to give some sense of the way in which one may have uh, a sacred experience based on the music and the the voice, and not necessarily on the space, as well as to raise the question of what is the effect of a so-called sacred space and a so-called secular space. And so these provide a sort of musical undertone uh, that can uh, affect you as you go along. Now, I start uh, the actual performance with a picture of my book. I was walking down Unter den Linden and realized later that this photo I had was the perfect um, illustration of when brains meet buildings. Um, but the purpose of the book was this. Uh, Okay, I'm, I'm going to just do one audience survey and then I'll stop. How many of you feel you have more than a minimal knowledge of neuroscience? Okay, so maybe one in five of you have more than a minimal knowledge of neuroscience. But here we are at a conference on neurophenomenology, and you're all phenomenal but very few of you are neuroscientists. And so the bandwidth of the conversation is really limited. You know, when Zach gives his inspiring talk, one can sit there with one's mouth open, which is apparently a sign of awe. But, but a lot of what he says goes over your heads rather than into your neurons, right? So the book, in a sense, is an attempt to initiate a conversation by telling architects more about neuroscience and neuroscience more about architecture in the hope that future meetings of this kind will have a larger proportion of people who've thought somewhat deeply about architecture, somewhat deeply about the brain, even though my sample, of course, is but a small sample of the knowledge that you share among you. Which one? Oh, the clicker, man. Thank you. What would I do without you? <laughs> okay, well, we've already built Jerusalem, so let's continue. So I first want to just start with how does neuroscience relate to the architect's task? And um, I just give three books. You've already seen that one of these covers before. Neutra in 1954 talked about survival through design, and he was worried about how design in an age of mass production could meet human needs. And he introduced what he knew at that time of neuroscience, biology, psychology, and so on. And then more than uh, 50 years later, John Eberhard, who a little before that had founded the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture, took advantage of the 50 or so years of neuroscience in between to formulate a set of issues that he felt would bring neuroscience and architecture together. And then finally, I've advertised my book. So let's just briefly look at Eberhard's uh, project. Uh, so how can classroom design affect the cognitive processes of children? How does the design of hospital rooms impact the recovery rate? How would working environments impact workers' productivity? How do sacred spaces instill a sense of awe in those who worship there? And the observation is that much of the investigation of this will be at the level of a psychological or cognitive exploration. But every now and again, our understanding of those architecture-relevant processes will be illuminated by, by the findings of neuroscience. But in terms of today, perhaps the question raised by that last line from Eberhard is, is awe all there is to it? And the answer, of course, will be no. Now, in Varela's book, he said, I use the term 
uh, neurophenomenology, a shorthand for the neuropsychoevolutionary phenomenology. So when I talk about neuroscience, I'm not saying, I'm saying it's necessary that we include the study of neural networks and real brains as part of it. But more broadly, I'm worried about a deeper understanding of psychology and a deeper understanding of evolution. And, and so the slogan is Evo Devo Socio. Our evolution gave us the genes that allow us to grow as humans. But the way we develop depends upon our physical and our cultural environment, thus the socio. But we are not only shaped by the social, we can change the social, as we've seen dramatically in our lifetimes. Finally, I need to mention this book, The Construction of Reality, which um, at the time it was written as the Gifford Lectures, um, it was a, an attempt to reconcile what Mary Hesse was doing in terms of how does a group of scientists construct a scientific reality? This fits in with Kuhn's idea of paradigms. Or, so you've got Newton's physics, a deterministic worldview. You've got a whole body of data that fits it, and it makes predictions that have also been verified. And then along comes Michelson and Morley, uh, along comes uh, Planck and Einstein, and suddenly you have to worry about quantum effects. And you end up with a theory against a lot of resistance that in the end sweeps along and says, no, no, the world is inherently probabilistic, but yes, in the large scale limit of our daily lives, yeah, then Newton does a great job and we can act as if the world was deterministic, just as even though we all agree that the earth goes around the sun, we still use, oh, when does the sun rise? When does the sun set? Because we, that is our relativistic center. Um, having agreed on how to reconcile the personal and the social in terms of this construction of reality, Mary and I just differed on one thing, the reality of God. Um, and uh, basically what she said was, how can we read the Bible metaphorically to give us a sense of reality that transcends the limits of the space and time of those physical theories? Whereas I suggested how we might use the same epistemology to ground, to ground a, a purely secular view that nonetheless includes morality and includes a sense of wonder. Now, here I say thank you to Sarah Robinson because my first talk on, on neuroscience and architecture outside uh, San Diego was at a conference she ran um, 11 years ago almost in uh, Tel and West. And the first speaker on the program was Yohani Balasma, who many of you know, um, and Revere, if we may even use that term in this context. And I uh, was giving the talk following his. Now, I'd read his uh, book, The Thinking Hand, and, and I found it a wonderful essay and learned a lot from it. But of course, as a neuroscientist, I couldn't help saying, well, you know, hands don't think. And you've got to have a brain in between. So um, Yohani was very big on the embodied self and the way in which the hands would link the experience of the, the, the body experience in the world and the hand sort of simulating experience of the world in drawing for architecture and so on. But I had written a book called How the Brain Got Language that said that um, if you think about the way in which the hands as well as the voice can implement gesture and the way in which we have evolved from primate cousins who don't have vocal control but do have manual control, then one can begin to develop a story of how language could have evolved through precursors in pantomime and so on to eventually be refined into vocal and signed language. So that the hand went from this um, system of embodied interaction with the physical that was Yuhani's to the way to which cr create unbounded symbolic spaces, language. And so hand to symbol and back again created a loop that I think is very relevant to us today and relates to that slogan of Evo Devo Socio. I wanted to give one example of linking neuroscience to phenomenology, or in this case, neurology. Uh, there is a syndrome in, oops, wrong pointer. <laughs> 
you see that all my, I'm going up, it's going up. That's interesting. So if I go this way, isn't that wonderful? You see, when you turn through 180 degrees, the cone also, I mean, this is a discovery, right? And now we have a whole new thing about how range, how these things work. And just, just amazing. No, no, it's, it's the 180 degrees. Okay, I, I digress. Now, um, so let's focus on this guy in the middle. Point this way. And what happens is if people have this um, damage to the area shown with the circle, then um, many patients will lose the left hand side of their body. So you ask them to dress and they'll put their right hand into the shirt sleeve. Done. You say, well, what about this, Mr. Smith? I don't know, maybe the surgeon put it there as a joke. So th this amazing dissociation where you lose half your body. So I'm saying that phenomenology, you know, if there's one thing you must believe as a phenomenologist is that you know your body. And the idea that a brain damage can lose half your body for you is pretty drastic. And then uh, now we get into the sacred space because we have the Pia plus Piazza del Duomo in, in Milano. And these two neurologists ask their patients with neglect, to imagine, so this now is not in the physical present, but imagine that you are facing the Duomo, the cathedral, describe what you can see. And as suggested by this cartoon, they describe beautifully the right-hand side of the plaza. They've lost half their memory. But then they say, okay, now imagine you walk over to the Duomo, turn around through 180 degrees like I just did, and describe what you see. And they describe perfectly the other side of the Duomo. So they've got this whole relation of the immediate present space and the imagined space depends for its integrity on this region of the brain being intact. And so the suggestion then is that even at this level of understanding classic neurology of brain relief, brain regions, we have a dissection of phenomenology. And my, my fantasy is that if we know about a dissection of phenomenology, then we might be able to create an architecture that is not simply looking at how do I tune the phenomenology that people can report, but how can I tune the different components so that in some sense I'm getting access to some of their non-conscious processes as well as their conscious processes in creating a, a, better, a better architecture. Okay. So I've put this up again to say that Language is central to being part of a human community. And I, what I want to get at is this. We might say that Homo sapiens is first Homo faber, the, the human who works, the stone tools and so on. Then we get language. And what I want to make crucial is a term that is seldom used, Homo querens, the, the human who asks questions. And I think a lot of what we're concerned with in religion is the quest to answer questions. You know, the basic question being, is that all there is? So what else is there? What is beyond? And so I, I think that under, so a lot of the discussion it looks at awe and atmosphere, and these are all important aspects. But I don't think we're going to understand the sacred unless we understand language and how it supports our very belief systems. And I'll come back to that in more detail as we go along. So, following on, must sacred architecture be awesome? Must awesome architecture be sacred? I think you know the answer, but let's look at some examples. Here's uh, Anjan. Uh, here's Uluru in the center of Australia. Uh, here's what's known to ignorant Westerners as Devil's Tower in Wyoming. And in each case, there is a local religious tradition and myths associated with these places. They're genuinely awesome. And the suggestion is that we may perhaps see one of the roots of religion in those groups who encountered places like this that are awesome, and they become sacred as the myths are created around them. But they are, if you will, proto-sacred even before the myths exist. 
so I, I haven't used that word before, but perhaps proto-sacred is a good word to, to reflect upon in, in our work. Here we come to uh, Notre Dame de Paris in the good old days before the fire. And we have both the awe of looking up and we have the play of light coming down. If we move around the world to Tadaiji and Nara, we have the awe of looking up both as we approach the temple and as we look at the Buddhas within. But in fact, if you don't have flash lighting, when you look up beyond the Buddhas, there is darkness. And so we have a dissociation that here are two sacred places which both rely on awe, but one relies on light and one relies on darkness as what you look up to. Um, and here is Calatrava's oculus. And I think this meets the sort of convention. If, if, if you didn't know, and I told you, this is a cathedral uh, that they've just built in New York City, but they haven't moved in the pews yet. Um, okay. You could probably believe it, but in fact, it's a transportation hub. So that I'm just sort of working for this dissociation. And the next example is science is awesome. I think I might've mentioned this. Uh, Balasma Taro gives us the experience of tactile light that has traveled thousands of light years throughout a space. And my point there is that Turrell is exploiting how awesome science is that we can get the concept of thousands or, or billions even of light years as part of our perceptual vocabulary. Okay. And now to, to move away from the awesome, here is a household shrine in Japan. Nothing awesome about it, but it's deeply spiritual for, for the Japanese family, a private place. Uh, here is a what was designed as a healing space in Los Angeles in a hospital, but it perhaps has many of the properties of being a sacred space. You could certainly go there to heal, but you could also go there for contemplation and prayer. Um, can places be sacred that are not made sacred by a religion? So here is uh, the example I'll use. Um, this bamboo grove in Kyoto, I think that as you walk through and the wind plays on the bamboo, um, it's a sacred experience, but it's not a sacred place. Um, it is not tied to any religious structure. You just feel that. But I jump now to Arkansas. And here we have one of Faye Jones famous chapels. And now he's not in a grove of bamboo, but he's in a grove of trees and the if you'll pardon the expression, we, the church captures the spirit of the grove. And we've already heard from Gordon that the word spirit has a broader meaning than that of a particular uh, religious tradition. But um, here we have the back and forth between something that is, as it were, naturally inspiring and something that captures and maybe distills the essence of that inspiration. And here, the, the opposite of awe is uh, Maya Lin's Vietnam's War Memorial, where the sacredness has nothing to do with the awe of the physical dimensions, but perhaps the awe of the sacrifices that were made. Okay. And now, this, this is not an actual photo that I took, but um, it recaptures an experience I had at the southwest corner of Australia, where the Southern Ocean meets the Indian Ocean. And the clouds were brightly illuminated. The wind was blowing against me. There was the roar of the waves. And I had what I now call an experience of ultimacy there, which had nothing to do with religion. But I just felt this oneness with nature and, and beyond, yes, I was beside myself, as they say. Now, William James in the different lectures that came 80 odd years before ours charted the varieties of religious experience. And then these were reverted to at a conference uh, I helped run in 1999, where Leslie Brothers, um, a psychoanalyst who had written this lovely book on how society shapes the human mind, joined Wesley Wildman, an Australian theologian who, who practices at Boston College. And they talked about the fact that experiences such as that I tried to demonstrate with the previous slide or that experience we had in the bamboo grove, 
An experience of ultimacy has to be placed into a semantic network, and that can be related in, to certain aspects of neural function. But what they say that's crucial, I think, is an experience of ultimacy becomes a religious experience to the extent that it accords with the social construct, construct of a religious community. So that experiences that I might have, the Buddhist might have as intensely, perhaps even more intensely, with that interpretation of Christian in a different way and so on. And then in the article, which I recommend, um, they go on to relate this to processes in the temporal lobe and processes in the hippocampus. So it is an entryway into the neuroscience of divine action. So now I come to this diversity of religions and the diversity of sacred spaces and places. It's easy for us to get trapped in a particular religious tradition and the traditions within that, that religion. And uh, for most of us, we're perhaps more familiar with Christian churches than with others. So I, I just wanted to give a, a sort of sampler. Um, the River Ganges, it is sacred. So here's a sacred place that isn't a building or a grove of trees. It's sacred because there is this river associated with the, the, the Hindu scriptures, if you will. Here is a truly sacred place, the Kaaba in, Me in Mecca. Um, it goes back long before Muhammad to, uh, to various religions, uh, rooted all the way back perhaps to Abraham. It's thought to be the place where you know, the opening to God's heaven exists. So here is a place that is truly sacred, and what is fascinating, and this has already been mentioned in passing, is that in each Muslim mosque, you have a space in a wall that points in the direction of the holy place. So places that are holy, not because it itself is holy, but as a pointer towards a place that is holy. And then as we've heard from time to time, there are traditions where the place is holy because the community is meeting there, not because of anything intrinsic or, or extrinsic about the place itself. And I think this is my last example for this section, and this is the Seder feast. And um, it is the, the, the Jewish celebration of the Passover, the escape from Egypt. And what I hear is that the space, the only space that's sacred is the space around the table defined by the family. And they're eating. And most of the foods are symbolic, and they're reading their, their ancient narrative of that escape from Egypt. And it's a family thing, so the children are being brought into the tradition. And all these things are gathered in this place that is only sacred for that period and for that set of rituals. And so that interaction of a place that's become sacred because it's awesome, like Uluru, a place that's sacred because there is a tradition that says this is where God encountered humanity, and places that finally are sacred because they're sacred within a particular ritual. All these things. So, I mean, the shorthand of all this is don't look for the awe center or the religion center in the brain. This is it taking all aspects of brain function and putting them together in various ways. And so we really, I've already said, we can't just look at vision and awe, we have to really think about language. And, and so it goes. And I just wanna make one more observation about this. And that is the, the sharing of food. And this is also the period of Ramadan, which is a period of fasting. And I think it's really interesting how feasting and fasting are such intrinsic parts of many religions. And one of the themes that I was surprised not to hear at this meeting, but people who talk about phenomenology and inactivism and so on often use it, is embodied cognition. And what's interesting is that when people talk about embodied cognition, they so rarely talk about real bodies. And so bringing that most primal of functions, eating, and then that more human decision to consciously not eat, really brings the body into play in a very interesting way that, that we can add to our other list of things to worry about. Okay, so I'd like to summarize what I've just been through by talking about three spaces. There's the space within. What are you feeling as you are in this sacred space? Then 
There's the space around the place, the building, and as we've seen, the people around you may be as important as the, the physical space itself. And finally, the space beyond the notion in a religion that there's something beyond this everyday reality. And so I, I think that's really the, the, for me, the prime schema in a different sense than the one I usually use um, of what we're about. How does the architecture contribute to the space around us in such a way that it changes the space within us and connects us to the space beyond us? Okay, I'm going to talk about brain imaging and religious experience very briefly, mainly to put some down and then to offer a tribute to Julio. Um, okay, so just as but you, you've all heard about this, but this is just a non religious scan where we have three comparisons. This is just one uh, visualization of a slice through the parietal lobes in terms of, in the first case, what lights, where is the brain most active as measured by blood flow? when you subtract the activity for just looking at an object to the activity of grasping the object with your mouth. In the middle, look at it and grasp it with your finger versus grasping it with your fingers. And in the last case, imagine that you're grasping it with your mouth. And you can already begin to feel a little tension as you try to interpret why the patterns change. But I'm only doing this to make the point that this is a very gross level of resolution compared to what the neurons are doing, but it's a fine pattern of resolution to pair compared to just saying, oh, the parietal lobe lights up or the frontal lobe lights up. And so I go back to perhaps what is the classic study uh, of brain scanning where Achillean Newberg commented in 1999 on brain scans of the effect of meditation on the brain activity of Tibetan meditators. And I'll show you uh, a couple of results in a moment. But they argue that the neurological architecture of our brains is naturally calibrated to spirituality because they claim they see a, an effect. Now, um, you could probably do a similar experiment where you have people look at videos versus looking at uh, videos of outdoor scenes versus videos of indoor dramas and say the brain is naturally calibrated to watch videos or something. That's the danger of such experiment. Whereas my view, and it goes back to, to Eberhard's position, experience changes your brain, that long training on practice at a task may modify brain regions. There's a lovely study of, um, of bus drivers versus taxi drivers in London, when the taxi drivers had to have this very detailed knowledge. And you find a huge difference in the hippocampus between the bus drivers who just have a route to follow again and again, and the much greater enlargement of a part of the hippocampus of the taxi drivers who must have this detailed spatial knowledge to come up with the appropriate route for the appropriate time of day and appropriate traffic conditions. So just here is the level of activity way back, and it sort of indicates, you know, this is 20 odd years ago and how far we've come, but how much further we have to go. At the top, increased activity in the frontal lobe, well, it's it's pretty feeble difference between the activities in the frontal lobe that you can see there, but it is somewhat higher in meditation and in baseline. This makes sense since meditation requires a high degree of concentration, and the front part of the brain is good for that. And then the other, the lower one is where they look at the parietal lobe and they say, look, there's a bit less activity in the parietal lobe, and say, well, that makes sense because the parietal lobe is involved in our sense of orientation in space and time. So if you're blocking out the sensory and cognitive input and getting the sense of no space and no time described in meditation, that makes sense. So the, the last comment is just to reinforce my point. But if you really want to understand what the brain is doing, just talking about the overall activity in big chunks of the brain is, is not going to be enough. But um, more to the point, I, I want to just notice for us the interesting state here is that the notion is that when you're meditating, you shut off the surround. So why do we care about sacred architecture if our goal is to enter a state in which the surroundings don't matter? And the point is, I think, that there are states that will help us to achieve that state if contemplation and, and silent prayer is our aim. 
by the writers, as I tried to illustrate with my videos, where it's being part of that community of the energy of that communal singing, for example, that lifts you up. And then the space of the people and maybe the larger space that shapes the music, as Jonathan has told us, um, will, will then be crucial. Um, this is just to give one old example. I mean, now this is about 15 years old of uh, another study of the brain, not in this case related to the space around or the practice, but this wild experiment having Danish Christians performing silent religious prayers. And as you can see at the bottom, you take a baseline of activity in part of the basal ganglia called the caudate nucleus, and you get somewhat lowered activity in wishing to Santa Claus or making rhymes. With personal prayer, it goes up a bit more, and with the Lord's prayer, it goes up even more. And so what's, what's happening in there? And, and one explanation might come from this middle paragraph, um, a study where people were being scanned who were playing games with another person where the nature of the game was such that if you tried to fool your opponent, you could get a short-term advantage. But if you could trust your opponent, then in the long term, both of you would gain more points out of playing the game. And so the suggestion is that they saw increased activation akin to that that was got in prayer um, for people who would trust their partners. And so maybe here is a, a sort of interesting link between interpersonal trust and, if you will, trust in the Lord, because the Lord's prayer was the best stimulus. Um, and, and so now we go beyond this, this, this linkage of very different experiments and trying to create, um, if you will, a, a Wikipedia of relevant uh, neuroscience uh, that one can then draw upon to perhaps understand phenomena that it would otherwise be mysterious. Now, a few years ago, uh, Julio and Yosho and others put together this very important study of architecturally induced contemplative states. And I'm not going to get into the details. There's a whole section in my book that describes it. And it describes both the way this was a path-breaking study, but as a path-breaking study, it also involved a critique of, well, what do we need to do next? And so the, the offers are there. But... Um, one thing I, I liked very much about the study was that it didn't simply record the brain activity of the people as they were shown these so-called contemplation-inducing buildings. Uh, but afterwards, it was uh, in an interview afterwards, people were interviewed as to how much they sort of lost themselves in the contemplation of the buildings. And then they were able to show that differences between the brain scans could be correlated with the difference in immersion. And so this fits a theme I think we've been hearing from Elizabeth and other people of the importance of having both the, the, if you will, the scientific type study and the questionnaire to try and say, okay, I see differences in the brain and I see what's going on. I, I thought the presentation of the current Union Station Basilica study, I didn't get a sense that there was an adequate attempt to probe the nature of the experience of the um, individuals, and that might have been why building an aggregate model was obscured, because one was lumping together people with very different experiences, even though for each of them they were enough to discriminate the two spaces. Okay, now, again, in relation to this issue of third person versus first person, I've, I've hinted at this earlier in the, the panel yesterday, but um, this interplay between the um, trying to understand the experience of the building, including the sacred space, and the experience that the architect brings to the design, which will include both their own first-person experience, but, and if we think of the examples that was were used by um, Eberhard of building for different people, including kindergarten children, you're going to be designing also for people whose experience you cannot channel directly, and you must try to, in some sense, simulate their first-person experience. Um, and, and so, I don't know, a whole other chapter of the book again, mirror neurons, I won't get into that, but um, just for those who haven't seen them, what we have here is a monkey um, is having a particular cell and its premotor cortex recorded. At the right, 
we see uh, 10 traces of the firing of a particular neuron when the monkey reaches out and does a precision grasp of an object on the tray. And if you instead put an object that required a power grasp, that cell would not be active. And then on the left, this was by, by chance, serendipity, the experimenter was putting an object on the tray using that grasp, and suddenly that neuron started firing. And so they discovered that those group of cells called mirror neurons active both when the monkey did something and when the, the human did the same act. And the, the picture of um, Alice here is from the, the second Alice book of Lewis Carroll, Alice Through the Looking Glass. And my, my point is that there's a lot beyond the mirror. And, and so one of my, my, so there are two themes I'd, I'll take, rather than getting into what people in architecture and aesthetics have said about mirror neurons, I, I want two different takeaways. One is that this whole set of insights into mirror neurons that stimulated brain scans of the so-called mirror systems came because we knew something about monkeys. And this inspired us to look for analogous mechanisms in humans, but then explore how the evolution of the human had enriched that, both the social and the biological evolution. I wear a, a frog tie because for me, the linkage between action and perception can be studied in a basic form in the frog that then provides new questions and insights as we think about the linkage of human action and perception. And, and then the other point I was just hinting at with Alice through the looking glass was that there is a tendency to say what part of the brain does this, what part of the brain does that. Now, with Zach's pictures, I think we got a sense of the way we had to look at a diagram linking different areas of the brain. And again, according to some anatomists, there are 500 areas of the brain. So as neuroscientists, we're not going to say, I'm telling you how 500 things interact. But I can say for this focus range of phenomena that you need to know about, here are as a, you know, half a dozen, a dozen key regions where I can have some sense of what their interaction is doing. And I, I just add my mantra that I don't think rhythms are the way to go unless you're dancing. All right. So I won't talk about mirror neurons and empathy. Um, how many minutes am I over? I think I've used up my time, is that right? So I won't stop. I will just show you what you're missing, okay? Um, so I was gonna talk about affordances. And here I just wanna make one important point. If you are designing a doorway as an architect, then on the one hand, you want this affordance, the possibility this is a place to leave the room, you're going to appeal to the conscious mind. They've got to see it to find out this is the path they can take to go through it. But if you're designing an art gallery, you might have a well-marked door to attract the attention of the gallery goer and a very hard to see door for the cleaning staff so that people will not be mistaken. But on the other hand, you've also got to design the width of the door in terms of the traffic you're expecting so that the non-conscious part of the affordance can control how people behave. Um, I'm going to keep going till Julia tells me to stop. Um, or Lorenzo comes and grabs the microphone. Three more minutes. Three minutes, okay. So it doesn't matter, does it? I mean, it's, there's all so much we could discuss. So it doesn't matter when I stop. So here are stairs, all right, the affordances for, for getting from one level to another. What's interesting as we look at this guy in the wheelchair is that he knows that's an affordance for other people, but he knows it's not an affordance that he can exploit. He doesn't have the right effectivities. But what interests me is that brings in an emotion, perhaps a yearning to be able to walk up the stairs. So we already see that even though the basic notion that Gibson came up with an affordance is based on physical actions in the world, already we have a link to action. Here we see the way in which the aesthetics blends with the functionality. Um, okay, script structure behavior. Like if I'm designing a building, I don't design it, but you know, hypothetically, if I were ready to design a building, I would be able to uh, say, well, what are people going to do in that building? And part of it would be, I don't want them to feel in the building, but also, hey, it's a restaurant. They better be able to find their table. And the, the server had better be able to find them and the kitchen staff had better be able to prepare them. So you have all these scripts of what people are doing, not in terms of what exactly will happen at every moment. That's why I mentioned the birthday party script. It's gotta be candles, guests, presents, and so on. But you don't have to do exactly the same thing at the same time 
a lot of flexibility. So I think that when people are building buildings, they have to think about what are the scripts and then what are the affordances they need to put in for the scripts. And then how can this be combined with the aesthetics of affordances I hinted on in that previous slide. So let me find what would be the best slide to go out on. Ah, okay. Um, we study emotion. Okay, I'm going to stop here. All right. And this will make my point. All right. Now, here is a truly ghastly depiction of a man being slaughtered. He is being bled to death. And it's not enough that nails are driven through his hands while he slowly dies in agony. But that cross is suspended in the air. So there's no way anybody can come and save him. True? Now, to most of you who are Christians, you don't see that when you look at that. You see a symbol of the resurrection. So this is just to make the point that I don't believe you can have a sac the truly sacred and a true religion without narrative. And that's why I go back to this point that things that can stimulate awe are only part of it. Having the narrative in which you locate the symbols and experience the spaces is tremendous. So here is my last slide. Oh, this is just the symbols made in the Stations of the Cross in a Catholic uh, mission church. But I close here. This is um, the Church of Our Lady of the Angels, the new cathedral, relatively new cathedral in uh, Chicago. Interesting, in Chicago, Los Angeles, right. Our Lady of the Chicago's, right? Our Lady of the Angels. Um, and what is interesting, well, one point is that this, this tapestry of the Virgin was only installed 20 years after the, the, the rest of the, the church was finished. But here it is now, as I experienced it just a couple of weeks ago, preparing myself for my time with you. And in this cathedral, the Stations of the Cross are sort of hidden on the back wall and round the corner in the corridor. And instead of the Stations of the Cross shaping this, you have this Mary dominates over the crucifixion. Uh, she's a benevolent figure. And then the tapestry on the side has all the saints gazing in adoration to the figure of the Virgin Mother. Uh, and for me, <laughs> if I were a Christian, I, I would prefer that symbolism to the symbolism of the crucifixion, even though I know that enriched by narrative, one's perception can be drastically changed. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. So we have three respondents, as I said. Um, we're going to start with Mohamed Kobeisi. He is professor and interim chair of neurology at GW, uh, George Washington University. He earned his BS in mathematics in, and MD from the American University of Beirut and a master's degree in English literature from GW. He pursued training in neurology at New York University and in epilepsy at John Hopkins. He has published 111 papers, edited four books on epilepsy, and earned about 3,000 citations. His donors include the Innovation Award from the Engineering School at Case Western for Deep Brain Stimulation Research. His investigation on consciousness was featured in a 2015 National Geographic documentary that aired globally in over 50 languages. Please, Mohammed. Thank you so much, uh, Julio. Thank you, Dr. Arvid. Uh, my brief response today can be viewed as an assessment of the whole subject of, of experimental theology and experimental theological aesthetics in general. Uh, while it addresses briefly and perhaps tangentially the areas of atmosphere and symbolism in particular, the issue of the designing studies on believers versus non-believers is emblematic of reductionism, even more fundamentally problematic than the classic limitation of the problem of ecological validity that we hear about in functional MRI studies, as Dr. Chatterjee alluded to on Friday. How do we identify where on the spectrum of belief a research participant is? How do we define the spectrum itself? 
is it independent from or does it intersect with atheism um, and uh, uh, agnosticism? Uh, for example, I have spoken with individuals who call themselves atheists and concluded that they were believers in some deity they couldn't define. And on the other hand, short conversations with some people who call themselves believers have led me to conclude that they are worshipers of some monarch or state in a religious rather than patriotic sense. I don't know what William Blake's intention was when he brought Jesus to England in the hymn that he wrote in 1808, which we heard twice earlier. Uh, one way to approach this complex subject is to define mystic experiences, aspects of which may be experienced by individuals in relationship to sacred space. Mystic experiences emerge from attention to the thing as it is, the deep understanding of which is inevitably connected with all things. The truth attained through mystic experience um, tends to be the culmination of some practice in most traditions. The practice often combines attentive body postures with laser sharp attention. The wisdom of the sages does not come from reading books or cultural narratives, but through removal of erroneous preconceptions about oneself, the other, and the world. Experienced practitioners thus are uh, potentially capable of seeing ultimate beauty in everything from a grain of sand to a cathedral. One may even argue that the aesthetic experience becomes independent of the culturally associated affect itself. As appraisal of all stimuli, whether familiar or novel, attractive or repelling by cultural standards, brings about the same sense of peace, a surprise as if encountering a miracle, and perhaps a feeling of unity. Regardless of the salience that a stimulus or a space elicits, they are encountered as novel due to the ability of such practitioners to reside in the present moment and minimize or completely eliminate judgments and preconceptions. In this case, if this is the case, the, 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 the discussion of experiences elicited by sacred spaces may be viewed as a discussion of what aspects of ultimacy akin to the aforementioned mystic experience to various degrees can be elicited by a space regardless of an individual's prior spiritual practices or understanding, whether affable or ineffable of the world. Uh, okay. Professor R.B. You, you argued that the key components to how a sacred space can elicit what is interpreted as a religious experience are symbolism and shared community. Since symbolism is tethered to cultural narratives, one must assume that the individual must embody rather than depart from those narratives. Here, um, one may argue that what is interpreted as a religious experience is nothing but a harmonized alignment of acquired and accepted cultural and religious constructs. And in this sense, it's a feeling uh, from which the individual concludes that the cultural narrative makes sense, like an experiential moment of what had hitherto been intellectual understanding of one's own culture. This is likely different from pure mystic experiences, which necessitate both embodiment and rejection. Uh, there is a oneness of duality here or double bind, both embodiment and rejection of cultural narratives and initiation of one's own journey through oneself and the world. Science evolves exponentially across generations, owing to the ability of our species to learn and build upon the accomplishments of prior generations. This is not the case in pure religious experiences, obviously or even an art where one has to find their own voice through their own journey. Similarly, the sense of shared community, uh, an adaptive feature in our species, uh, likely plays a surrogate role in the religious experience that is different from pure mystic experiences. Uh, obviously, the argument here is easy. One can elaborate by saying that the sense of community is helpful through evolution, whether it's related to a spiritual practice or not. And on the other hand, uh, mystic experiences can be attained within groups or individually. Thank you. Okay, quick response. I still have it. Okay, I have power. Um, no, I thank you very much. I I think the distinction is I was not trying to say that 
we can reduce the experience of the sacred to a narrative or we can reduce it to a sense of awe. Oh, I was trying rather to say whenever we approach sacred experience within a particular religious tradition, there are going to be a set of relevant considerations to take part. And I think in particular, when you relate to a religious tradition, then you have to bring in the narrative. This doesn't preclude that our ability for emotional response, our sense of wonder. I mean, I'm atheist with a sense of wonder. And I, my science is driven by a sense of wonder. How could the universe work in this way? And, and, and so I was not trying to give an exhaustive sense, but just trying to indicate that the understanding of how the human evolved to master language and symbolism and narrative within a communal context seemed to be an essential part of the conversation. And that does not mean we can reduce everything to let's have a good conversation. Our second respondent is uh, Harrison Fraker. Uh, he received his MFA in architecture from Princeton and Cambridge universities. His teaching practice and research span over 50 years, first at Princeton, uh, from 1968 to 84, then as chair of founding of uh, Dean at the University of Minnesota in 1984-95, where I, I met him first time. And finally, as a fifth dean at the College of Environmental Design at UC Berkeley from 1996 to 2019, he has received 10 major design awards, the 2014 the Topaz Medallion, the highest award for excellence in architecture education, and his Oakland EcoBlock was chosen as a top 10 transformative project by uh, the Scientific American in 2018. His most recent books, which some of us have seen, of course, here, call it Minding the City, Field Notes on the Poetics of Sustainable Public Space by Auto Editions, uh, um, uh, published in 2021, is available. So please, uh, Harrison, join this. So uh, what an extraordinary pleasure to be here. Thank you, Julio, for inviting me and for the amazing presentations that we've seen over the last couple of days. Um, it's been a really, really rich conversation. And I want to thank Michael, who I actually, I thought he was going to be more of a troublemaker and more of a creative director. A disruptor than his last talk. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I think what I loved about it is he actually showed vivid examples of the points he was trying to make. And um, so what I'd like to add to what he's already put on the table comes from my interest in perception and cognition and I like to um, focus on that as a way to try to understand how and what makes a place meaningful. And in that search, um, I did turn to neuroscience in part because my son got very interested in it, but I had this long history of readings in uh, perception and cognition. So I was totally inspired by Sarah Robinson's book, uh, Mind and Architecture. And this made me try to kind of comb through neuroscience and see if there were key insights that would change my understanding and help me to appreciate how meaning is constructed in a place. And, um, Michael has um, pretty much gone over most of them, but I would like to add a couple that I'm going to talk about just briefly in, in the next uh, panel discussion. So number one is my curiosity and interest in trying to figure out how something comes mean, becomes meaningful is really important. Neuroscience has shown us that the desire for meaning in our lives is primal and fundamental. And it is not constrained by culture or um, ethnicity 
or age, we are always seeking uh, meaning in our lives. And even those folks who have the least, in some cases, uh, meaning is all they have. So this desire to try to understand what makes something meaningful is really important for everybody here. The second thing is um, I really am into the neuro uh, mirror neurons because um, you know you know the thinking hand and so on, um, and the the case that it makes that embodiment theory is probably a pretty important conceptualization of what happens when we're experiencing things, that we do actually simulate in our brain, whether we know it or not, certain gestures uh, in the space we, uh, that can be symbolized by our bodies. Uh, we feel these things. And um, we also appreciate and understand, in some cases, the process that made something. We actually try to understand if something is a certain way, how did it get that way? And we try, we simulate that in our mirror neurons. And we also empathize with the expressions. His last image of all of the saints looking at Mary on the wall is a way in which we immediately empathize with that gesture, even though it might take us a while to appreciate that that's what is creating a kind of essence in that space. And, you know, I believe in affordances, but, um, you know, the, the wonderful thing about affordances is you see how a space is used, you imagine how you can use it, you even use it certain ways, but at the very same time, you bring the history of how you used it, your memories of how you use it, and you even project how you might use it in the future. So it's a kind of thick moment that uh, is part of perception and cognition. Um, and finally, uh, there, there are types of attention. I'm really interested in those. Um, you know, when we have an intuition and a kind of sense of a place that we think is spectacular, uh, how does that occur? What kind of brain functions are synthesizing all those things, that kind of explosive uh, moment of feelings that you get in a certain place? Um, is that truly the right side of the brain? And then do we go back and try to understand that by going in detail through the, the way in which uh, those expressions have taken on a story and a meaning. Um, I also think we build up over time uh, schemas. He talked about schemas in the very beginning, and I really appreciate that. They are built both in our bodies, from the time we're in the womb, uh, simple things like containment, verticality, balance, all these fundamental things we learn in the first person. And then we learn things socially. So we have social constructs. So the schemas that we've built up, which we use to evaluate the environment, are built both individually and socially. Um, and all of this hinges, all of these kind of insights that are part of our brains and our bodies help us build the narrative. They're just the beginning. They aren't the answer. Um, there isn't any formula here for design, but they can create a tendency, a openness and the discovery of a narrative of a place. He constructed the narrative of that church in the last place, didn't he? It's a simple rectangle. There's a thing that was added at the end that gave it a focus, which was not the, the crucifixion, 
And then he saw all the uh, saints honoring Mary. So he has constructed a narrative that's been triggered by the space. So what I'm interested in are these insights that help us construct meaning and, and understand our spaces. And I think he's done a great job of illustrating that. So thank you. The third uh, respondent is uh, Suchi Reddy. Her 20-year-old award-winning studio, Ready-Made, embodies her ethos, form, follow, feeling. Using new aesthetics to amplify the potential of design, her practice spans various typologies of all scale from interiors to installations to architecture. She currently teaches at the School of Architecture at Columbia University and also at the Cooper Union. Please, Suchi. Thanks, sir. So when I listened to Michael, Michael, by the way, I think I forgot to tell you the first time I ever heard you lecture was at the new school um, in San Diego when I was first beginning to learn about this field and it was such a, you know, everything was new and open and it was really wonderful to hear you speak about it. So thank you from then to now. Um, and also to address some of these amazing concepts that both Harrison and Muhammad have brought up. Um, and for myself, really, to think about what do I, as an architect, learn from this? Why am I here? What do I take away? What do I? What can I take into my practice? And some of what I was thinking about, uh, Michael, uh, somehow brought to mind this um, thought from uh, Gadamer, where he says he was studying aesthetics, and he says aesthetics is not the study of specific types of subjective pleasures that are derived from art. It's a study of what objectively informs our subjective awareness of art. And this is something that I think we're trying to get to here in some ways in, in terms of really understanding what embodied cognition and moment, thank you so much for bringing that up into the conversation today, um, really means to us when we experience space, when we experience architecture and when we experience our world. And coming from a culture that, uh, uh, I'm Indian, believes that enlightenment is a body-mind state thinking about if that's actually the purpose of my life here on this planet, what, what influences my body and mind? What is the experience? What are these experiences around me that can, that can actually shape that and lead me on that path maybe in this lifetime or more um, is something that's been of interest to me. And you know, as part of why I actually look to architecture, although that's kind of a difficult thing to say in most circumstances, whether that's a client conversation or uh, an academic conversation, it truly is one of the things that I'm interested in maybe finding out a little bit more. Um, so some of these conversations actually lead towards that, that kind of a quest. Um, and one of the things I was thinking about is, uh, Michael, you actually surprised me as you did Harrison um, by, you know, really, understanding what we're trying to do as architects, because uh, you often <laughs> don't give me that impression, uh, but uh, you know, where you say architecture connects the space within to the space beyond. And that truly is what we try to do. And we're always trying to connect the unconscious to the conscious as well. Our experience of space and this kind of, we're this threshold through which we take in this information, we process it, and we, we understand ourselves not just our world through this. And architecture then is this incredibly important tool that can allow us to understand our own condition as humans. And, and that's something that, that surprised me. And um, when you were talking about scripts and affordances and the aesthetics of affordances, I, I came across the word affordances when I first started learning about this field, maybe about 10 years ago. And it took a while to understand actually what affordances could mean and how they, what, you know, how different uh, researchers use that word. And uh, it's interesting to think, I was thinking about myself trying to reframe my work in the lens of a designer of affordances. And to me, that just felt really reductive that in some ways that's not at all what I'm trying to do. I might look at designing a staircase in a million different ways as an affordance to allowing somebody to understand how they use a space or a building or a city, but that's not really what I'm doing as an architect. And with that, I leave it with the three of you. Um, 
Michael, do you want to respond? Well, I, I just like to ask for an amplification of that large point. Last point. Uh, when you say you don't care about the affordance when you design the staircase. I mean, surely you, you must be worried about getting from one floor to the other and you must be finding a way to do it. But as my three point slide suggests, the way you do it can vary greatly. So the affordance for me would be the necessary basis for what you do, but you say it isn't. Well, or you're just saying that that's the easy part and the hard part. Yeah, what I was saying is that the script is actually the more difficult part. What I'm trying to understand as an architect is write the script, both for how people of all kinds, all different you know, ranges of experience, let's say, in different ways, like you were talking about the different people who use the one kind of door in the gallery versus the other kind of a door. All of these kinds of things that we sort of process as the functional scripts that run through the design of a space that absolutely need affordances like doors, windows, staircases, steps, all of these kinds of things. But I'm not thinking of myself necessarily as somebody who designs the aesthetic appearance of affordances. Like that's not the important part of architecture. For me, what that does is really, it's the, I guess what I'm looking at is the, the, the holistic script that runs through everything in the space that's not just what allows me to use it, but also what it makes me think of and realize yeah. about other things. No, I, I would that it may say not be the script is primary, but uh, again, there can be multiple scripts in the building, right? I mean, different people will be using the building in different ways. And then my concern is, but then you have to provide the, the affordances for those scripts. And some affordances may be common to multiple scripts, some may be unique. So I would see that, that in my ignorant way, I see that graph of affordances, as it were, as underlying yeah. your creativity. Is this on? Um, yeah, I think affordances could be described as the kind of base program that you're trying to design for. And then that's using architecture terms, but that what I think she was getting at is the idea that being able to have a stair that gets you from one floor to the other is only the beginning. Um, and that's why I love the fact that he showed multiple stairs, including Michelangelo's stair to the Bibliotheque Laurentian Library, which kind of explodes in the space and gives you um, multiple ways to ascend um, when you could have just had a pragmatic stare. So um, affordances are really important. And the thing I like most about those is the idea that when you bring your body to the stair in the Laurentian library, and it affords you to get into the library, you bring your experience of stairs throughout your career, many of which were meaningful and some not. And you, at the same time, you can't help but project other ways of ascending. So um, this idea of an affordance as an enabler and the invitation to an activity is kind of just the beginning in, in my field, but essential. And that meaning comes from it allowing you to do these things, but then allowing you to do them in certain ways as opposed to others. I think it's time to hear from the audience. Um, okay, Zach has a question. A surprise. All right, so. Um, Thank you, Michael, for a very nice presentation. I just I think I have two things I'd like to well, one is basically a statement, the other one would be a question. The first one being that I think the way we're using affordances is completely off uh, in Gibbs Gibsonian way. Uh, I think someone uh, well, at least there is a collection about the way we use affordances and the variety, which makes it not wrong the way we use it, but um it basically just means that the ways that we can use it is very like very uh, variety. Let me just answer that before you move sure. to the question. Yeah, I mean, I spit, I, I spill a lot of ink on saying why I will not restrict myself to Gibson Sets. <laughs> I mean, I had a public debate with him 40 years ago where we agreed to disagree. 
And so I, if I think we're to fully get the use of the word affordance to meet the needs of architecture, as well as studies of animal behavior, then we have to enrich his focus. I completely agree, but I think that it's worth to just say that we're talking non-Gibsonian. That was the full, the full lecture for those three slides. Absolutely. So my second point would be uh, the question. Um, I think from the presentation yesterday, uh, there is a general interest in transitions in architecture. So my personal experiment started from trying to understand the experience of uh, transitions from, well, zero to 500 milliseconds. My next study would be try to understand it within the realm of two seconds. And now uh, Dr. Kanepa is doing a transition experiment uh, talking about, well, the whole situation of, of, a, of a transition. I think that really speaks to the nature of uh, narratives. But I'm not quite sure anymore what we mean about narratives, because it seems like there are very different time scales of, of narratives. I was wondering if you could elaborate on what you mean when you talk about narratives. Okay, well, just firstly, a comment that there's a very nice example from Kubusier of a mosque where you go into a small ante room and then you go through, and then the mosque is more awesome because of that contrast. So it's an interesting thing when the transition prepares you for something versus when it is designed to anti prepare you so that you get a more intense experience. So that's one thing about transitions. No, narrative here, I, I mean, it's just a narrative in the sense of telling a story. And so in this case, I mean, if I, I if I, you know, the boring story would be, well, I got out of bed and I, I went and brushed my teeth and, um, oh gosh, before that I had a drink of water. Oh no, no, before that I, I, you know, that would be not a narrative, but it would just be a sequence of events. Whereas if it's structured as a story with, a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's some tension. There may be some false paths that are corrected. So that was my point with respect to the crucifixion. If I look at the crucifixion as a naive outsider and just see a hideous scene of torture, because I don't have that narrative, but if I've been exposed to the 12 stations of the cross and the notion of the resurrection and so on, then I can interpose that experience within that narrative and it totally changes what i see so that's the effect of a narrative as a story i think will be a good a good synonym for the purpose of how i was using it in this story. questions jonathan please talk <laughs> man uh i want to go back to uh what suchi was trying to talk about, I think, and say something that maybe is a little preposterous, I don't know. But uh, affordances should almost disappear. Like they should be, it's kind of like technology. It, the better technology is, the less you are aware of it. It's kind of like if you design an app really well, the person who designed the app doesn't want you to know all the decisions they made in designing that app. They want to get you to the experience of whatever that app affords, right? Um, and so I know this is a, a very <laughs> diminutive perhaps uh, example, but we do live in worlds that are both real and virtual. So that's why I bring the digital into the conversation because for many that's very much part of their world every day, spending a lot of time immersed in environments that are not you know, the physical environment around us, but kind of transported to some other place. So I do think that that parallel um, thinking about designing in the digital world for these virtual experiences and what we do as architects, there is something there. But but you know I, I think as Suchi, perhaps that's what you're trying to say that when we design, everything goes into the thinking of the width of the door, how you know the what the door handle is made of, et cetera, so that the person flowing through it or going to it doesn't, it's a subconscious decision. If you've designed it well, they don't even have to think about where to go, where they, where, they don't even need the exit sign. They know where the exit is, right? So, but that's not the purpose of architectural design and certainly not what a lot of architects aspire to. It's well beyond. So I'd love to go back to the question of transition and the idea of 
perception and cognition related to that. Because um, my, um, my, my experience um, was crystallized when you look at two kinds of cubism. If you look at the serial cubism of the nude descending the staircase, where it's a portrayal of those intervals captured sequentially. And then you look at the synthetic simultaneous cubism where the painter has layered multiple views on top of each other and you see uh, their interaction uh, where the transparency of one is seen through another. And for me, this is an artistic expression of something that our brain does, where we build something up sequentially and then we understand it as a whole in relationship to a whole range of things. And that's why I'm hoping that eventually neuroscience will be able to show us when we're doing the incremental processing, if you will, and when we're synthesizing and layering and trying to comprehend um, our understanding of those things. So um, we've seen, you know, that's why uh, Elizabeth's work is so interesting because in the transition, atmosphere can completely change the behavior. So we know it, it is important, um, but uh, we wanna know so much more. <laughs> and that's what I'm hoping we can get to. I'm a, I was a little confused by the question, Zach. Um, was the atmosphere being referred to as a narrative? The atmosphere of the transition? The actual experiment is about starting from somewhere. You change the corridor. The actual experiment is about starting from somewhere. You change the corridor and you basically get to the exact same space independent of the right. uh, of the corridor. So basically here, the idea is that the final experience is colored by the prior experience, right. which uh, implies the importance of, well, transitions and the narrative, which I suppose you, I would call a, a narrative because for me, it's uh, the idea of a narrative, as I understood, Michael, would basically be the uh, the way that you dress the events, but the events are the events, and you probably will not be able to change these these events. But the way you tell yourself, like autobiographically, perhaps, is the narrative. So that's that's in the way that I was talking about the transitions. Yeah, for me, I was reading it as the quality and the atmosphere of that transition that then changes or sets you up to understand the entire experience differently. So uh, thank you. Yeah, so I obviously didn't make my point before. That's why I distinguished between got up, got out of bed, grabbed a towel across my head or something, um, from telling a story. A Beatle song, please. So so all I'm saying is no, the the what happens if if you so here's an idea. You build a building, right? And every day people go through it and there are particular sequences. They go through particular rooms with particular ends in mind. Now, those are time sequences. There's, there's no particular narrative there. But if somebody now says, oh, when I went to the kitchen, the, 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 the pot was boiling over and I had to rush to the bathroom to grab a towel. And then that takes aspects of a sequence, leaves out many pieces and comes up with something that has a charge to it, that it's a story of interest. So I'm making that distinction between mere sequence and, if you will, partial reflections, even temporary orderings of sequences that have their power in their sort of narrative structure, their persuasion, their storytelling. And, and, and so conversely, you might say that the scripts that the architect might come up with are informed by stories she wants people to experience in the building, but they're not going to have sort of word for word of the story is echoed with each footfall through the building. It's just, they will build up in, in a sense that layer of perception that you talked about. Yeah, for instance, the script for me in the Laurentian library, which is just one of the most amazing spaces I've ever been in, 
is you know experiencing the ceiling the patterns the way that the patterns talk to each other the different scales of that and you know all the images of the uh, the skulls and the animals and and the things that he's put in there there are discoveries within this space so the width of the stair and how it allows me to move up there and you know raise my head instead of feeling like i need to hold the handrail in order to not fall over is something that i do like hannah was saying would be something nobody would notice, but would be looking at a whole other story. And this is really what I think the script of architecture is. Uh, I just, just quickly, um, I don't know if you know this, but you know, Corbusier talked about the so-called uh, promenade architectal, and he would try in his buildings to design a spatial sequence which was privileged over other ways you could go through in normal routines it would be really interesting to see if we recognized that as a special and privileged route through the building i think of the villa garsh as an example everybody's written about what he did as you come in and bounce off this go up this stair hit this wall you know, you have this full embodied experience of the whole building that he wanted you to, to experience. He wanted to privilege that. Now, is that a narrative? Kind of. It's just his sense that this is a way to go through the building, which will unveil its spatial organization. So, um, I, you just know. changing changing topics for a minute. Uh, Out of narratives. Um, I have a question for you, uh, Michael. I think if I understood right, you said that language is fundamental to architecture. Is that correct? The, uh, the neuroscience and architecture? To religion. To, re oh, to religion. Okay, so what, what about architecture? You think language, you know, so I, would, I would propose that, and this, we haven't talked about this topic in, in this conference, but I, I propose that the, the experience of architecture, the phenomenology of architecture is fundamentally number fundamentally non-verbal. Um, so if that's so, that has a strong implication for neuroscience, right? Uh, if it's non verbal for an embodiment to all kind of situation now, there is a part of it that is language related, but it's a kind of translatable into language. The, the immediate experience, even conscious experience, not just unconscious, is non-verbal. Would, how, what, how, how would you respond to that claim or that hypothesis? What number? distinguishes the heathen tortured Christ from the Roman Catholic symbol of love of God. What number? You're totally raising a different question. I'm not ruling out proportion as part of architectural design. I'm just saying that if you are to think about what makes a space sacred, the symbols have to be understood in many cases and it's not just the proportions. Almost, we can have an awesome space which has no symbolism in it, no stained glass, no statues. It's just a space that makes us feel very special. But even I mean, I, but, I agree with that. But I, I'm saying that to get that impact of a Christian space, in one case you have these symbols that require that you know Correct. narratives. In other case, if you go to a Christian science room or a Quaker room, then you don't need any of those symbols because you are just attempting to look inward and it's a space just to look inward without looking out towards. The tricky thing about the, most of the symbols in religion are non-verbal. Um, you know, they're images, right? They're images. Of course, you know, you're explained, they're explainable through birth, but by and large, enter into the system. After two glasses of wine, I will convince you I'm right. All right. <laughs> okay, one more question and then we are ready for the break. Anybody else? Or all right, last question. I'm gonna get in shape and move So I would say this is kind of a long shot or maybe it's a long shot, but do you believe um, that mirror neurons could be further stimulated by design? So for example, in like an art gallery, is there a way that uh, architects can manipulate the space to allow for one to be more appreciative, be more like um, embraced and processing the art. <laughs> okay, if you study mirror neurons, it's not just that this magical thing that goes up and down, 
there are mirror neurons that are differentially tuned. So in the basic example I showed, it's just, do you see a hand that is doing a precision pinch? Some mirror neurons light up. Do you see somebody doing a power grasp? Others may respond best for tearing paper. So the idea is that that is the part of the brain that is responding both when you act and when you see related actions. Now, so it's interesting if, if you show somebody um, a barking dog, but don't ask them to imitate it, just what's the dog doing? Parts of the brain will light up to recognize the dog is barking. They won't light up because it doesn't map onto your action of barking. However, once you've tuned a whole repertoire of mirror neurons that pick up many different features related to action, then you can find yourself in a situation where patterns of activity will be elicited that are not related to observing a particular action. Now, and I think Harry Malgrave would be arguing, this is what's happening with Einfühlung, where you feel your way into a building because features of the building are somehow eliciting patterns of recognition that perhaps were tuned to human experience. And then when we conversely turn to awe, as those mountains uh, suggested, it may be the other way around that you start with the way other parts of your brain recognize certain spatial, temporal, auditory, tactile patterns, and then they can become associated with particular actions of people and interactions of people, and then that can enrich your experience. So I'm just trying to get away from that idea of um, <laughs> just mirror neurons as being something that turns up and down. It, there's, there's specific patterns related to specific experiences, but now it's a bit like the keys on the piano. Each one is for a particular note, but you can play new chords and, and new instruments once you've got the notes in place. So it's a bit like that. I think with this, we say goodbye to the people that have been with us uh, on the internet. Um, so thank you for being with us. The rest of us will continue. Uh, we have a, a break now. We have a, another uh, panel uh, followed by a, a large conversation. So thank you, the panelists and the lecturer, please.